Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Well, our last time together, we put words to the reality that we are in a war with food. But uh, I think it's so important that my dear friends, Matt T. Meyer, Diane Summers. Hi, guys. Thank you for coming back. Hello there. Hi. So w- w- you put well the fact that we are at war with food. We're at actually war with shame with regard to our bodies, including the interplay between our sexuality and eating both involve desire, pleasure. And Matt, you, you put it so well that food sometimes gets named as sinful, decadent, uh, over overindulgent. Uh, and in naming that, uh, it's a link that I want us to come back to before we jump into a whole new topic. So, could you take us a little further in the connection between desire, shame, our bodies, food, and sexuality. No big deal in just a moment or two, right? Yeah. 30 seconds or so. That be, that'd be <laughs> as long as you wish. Uh, um, well, as, as we've spoken about earlier, um, these are very parallel desires within us in many ways. We're meant to have them. We're meant to experience goodness from them. Uh, I think we're, we're meant to experience the delight of God through our sexuality and through, uh, as Diane said earlier, the, our taste buds, the things that we've been given to give us such a tremendous uh, nuanced sense of engagement with our world. And as we, as we think about how how darkness wants to get involved with this and invade it. I think that sabotage, sabotaging us in the, in the places in which we enjoy is a really efficient way to do so. Um, and so the kinds of things that we enjoy the most uh, are now weaponized uh, against us. So the more tasty foods we have, um, you know, we sort of have a, a nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of attitude toward these foods. Um, the way we would talk about some kind of illicit sexual activity when there isn't so much any attention given to what happens if we engage this food uh, entirely open hearted uh, with a, with a notion that we're going to enter into it, uh, staying in touch with our bodies, hearing what they have to say, receiving it fully. Um, receiving um, when when our bodies tell us it's time to be done, um, that goes out the window, and instead, um, because of our fear of goodness, our fear of pleasure in general, we want to tune our bodies out entirely, and uh, sort of close our eyes and wait till it's over. In many ways, yeah. I- I think what's coming to mind um, in particular is when I'm working with folks who have a history of uh, sexual trauma and how much disconnection has come as a result of that, wanting to be out of their bodies, away from the experiences of their bodies. And um, for many, having paired an experience of shame with arousal during trauma and therefore not wanting to experience what I would call arousal towards food, which is hunger, desire, interest, appetite. So wanting to cut that off at the pass um, out of earlier experiences of feeling like their body betrayed them when in essence it was a very natural and normal response to happen in the midst of a traumatic experience. So pleasure is at war, but you're also saying that, and I think it's so important to underscore this, that that God gave us food for more than, shall we say, nutrition. God gave us food for play and pleasure and for communion, for engagement with ourselves and for others. And 
that's a radical but such an elemental part of talking about this war with food and the debris that comes. So when we talk about eating and food, would you say that shame is at play in a way in which most people have not named the interplay between shame and their own eating? Absolutely. Um, and the shame cuts, cuts both ways, I would say, in the sense that um, in our fear of our own bodies, our fear of our own desire, um, we turn that into a weapon against the people around us as well. Um, th- there's no place on the body spectrum uh, of size and shape where anyone generally feels safe and at home and happy with themselves. And so, on one hand, we look in one direction and say, oh my goodness, I am, I'm not okay, I need to change things. Uh, and on, on looking in the other direction, we generally say, well, but I'm in better shape than that person. And, and this is a comfort to us, I believe. And it's one of the reasons we don't just drop the whole thing, realizing that we're all dealing with shame and agree uh, not to do it to each other. Well, the compounding war then, that at one level, uh, and I, I feel caught. I, 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 I'm glad that right now we are uh, distant. You didn't see my face uh, and how it scrunched up when you said, looking at others and going, well, at least I'm not like that. Uh, so the interplay of pride that really is fueled not by, in one sense, mere arrogance, but more out of shame, uh, that intersection of I'm not what I should be, but at least I'm not as bad as you are. Uh, that That's a killer that both are in operation. Absolutely. It's, it's a complete no-win situation. So would you put that as part of the debris that we are we're we're not just struggling with food we're struggling with shame and the implications of that for how we relate to people around us. I would again to coin a to coin another term it's sort of as though we're cannibalizing ourselves with with shame and uh and pride. No one no one is safe essentially. Well, and I, certainly I've worked with people who would have, uh, at least in their mind, or better said, in uh, the minds of others, a near perfect body, whatever that means. And yet I have never worked with anyone who's just been like uh, honored, thrilled, uh, being able to bless their body as it is, and particularly uh, being uh, somewhat older than the two of you, I'll say that as you age, it becomes uh, uh, even more difficult to bless the fact that you don't have the same muscles in your face, therefore your face sags, and you look more disposed to being irritated and angry at others, when in fact uh, your body is just indeed, giving itself over to something of the process of decay. So, that judgment process, contempt being very deeply rooted in our eating histories. Uh, again, I, I, we're, we're going to spend another whole session on how to dislodge, how to begin to engage this. But uh, I'd love for both of you just to grapple with, where do you deal with contempt in your own eating uh, and in the eating of others? Yeah, Dan, so you named, you know, the intersectionality of different forms of oppression in our culture, and you just uh, blended um, sizeism um, with ageism, and that we don't have an honor for um, bodies changing and aging. Um, we expect someone to have the body of a 20-year-old when they're 70, um, to have skin so tight, like a 20 year old, um, when they're 70 and, and that when you layer on these isms, um, it, it, you know, it's essentially possible to be, to become just so buried in all the forms of, of, um, intersectionality within the systems of oppression that we have. Well, and that's, that's true across racial. I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that this is, this is not just middle-class people who are having to do wars with food in their bodies. 
Absolutely not. I think that, you know, the marketing that we see out there, um, even for eating disorder treatment centers tend to show, uh, thin white female identifying bodies, but, uh, there are, uh, folks from so many marginalized groups who are struggling majorly, um, with food and body issues and the national eating disorders associations, marginalized voices campaign actually just came out with some statistics, um, that showed that teenage girls from low income families are 153% more likely to struggle with bulimia than girls from wealthy families. Um, so right there, we know that it's not about coming from a rich, um, or middle-class family. Uh, that rates of disordered eating have across you know, increased across all demographic sectors, but a faster rate in male, lower socioeconomic, and older folks. That was a 2014 study. Black teenagers are 50% more likely than white teenagers to exhibit bulimic behaviors such as binging and purging. Um, the war against food and body uh, does not discriminate. Um, it hits every sector um, of of our population. So oppressive structures, whether it be racism, uh, whether it be ageism, uh, whether it be body shaming, the the bottom line is evil's intent is in some ways to weave all of this form of harm and contempt into structures that inevitably create well just what the data you offered so much more debris that comes uh, for those who are uh, less less financial capacity to be able to resolve it through therapy or through uh, working with a dietitian etc cetera, etc cetera. It, it 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 just feels dark does it not it's very dark Absolutely. And I think, um, speaking of the economic piece, uh, a large factor playing into that is food insecurity, uh, not knowing when the next meal is coming or uh, where it's going to come from and how that can disrupt the relationship with food. There's also a perception that um, someone who struggles with anorexia must be in an emaciated body type. But that's actually only 20% of those who struggle. In fact, the rates of what we call atypical anorexia, anorexia, in other words, in larger bodies, is three times the rate of anorexia in the emaciated body type. Um, yet this group is consistently overlooked. Um, and when they are engaging in behaviors to try to change their body, they are praised um, for the behaviors that someone in a smaller type, um, those around them might express concern for that. So that's, oh, it, it just compounds the harm. And I would say social media makes it even, even easier for people to receive this kind of praise for behaviors that hurt themselves. And, and, and how does that play out, Matt, in terms of, of the people that you have worked with? You, you see um, divided divided souls, I guess that's the way I would put it. People who may, on one hand, have um, complete understanding that they're harming themselves, um, and at the same time, uh, getting reinforcement of, of the, you know, from the praise that they're getting, and the part of them that's, that's uh, disordered in their eating uh, gains fuel from that. And these things can be heavily compartmentalized. And if the wall between those two parts is big enough, then um, there's no, I mean, there's no limit really to how far that disordered eating can go, even when the person's completely aware of doing damage. So you're, you're rewarded for doing harm, but harm that's somehow presented as healthful because you're losing weight and gaining not only stature and the appreciation of, oh, you've lost 10 pounds or 20 pounds or whatever it might be. But in fact, you're literally setting yourself up not just for the yo-yo diet, but for the intensification of this interplay of judgment, pride, shame, contempt, and in some ways, repeating structures 
very similar to the demands and the violence that often comes to those of us who have been abused in one form or another. So it's, it's genius on evil's part to replay this reenactment again and again. Uh, I mean, I just want to scream. It really is just horrendous to think we're talking about a culture committed to its own self-decimation. I think that that's well said. Um, this is the place at which um, I think that we are all too willing to turn over our awareness around our bodies uh, to something outside of ourselves. And so especially, uh, well, I won't say especially, I would say whether it's praise or it's uh, shame of some kind, we give um, the, the words of others a great deal of credence with regard to our bodies. Um, we sacrifice the, the listening to the, our bodies for the sake of the opinions of those around us. Well, it, both of you have named this idea of being attuned to your body. And I, 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 I'll tell you just a short bit of my own history, but let me give you a fact. Uh, apparently, in about 1920, 25, the average meal, uh, dinner meal, was about 90 minutes long. Uh, research, I think this was about 2005 or six. Uh, the average meal was 12 minutes. So w- we have literally created a dinner process that went from being conversational, leisurely, engaging, to being fast, furious, a form of almost binging indulgence uh, in order to eat and get away from what the family uh, somehow symbolizes. And when I look back to my own life, my primary role, uh, I've said in a number of contexts, was I was the storyteller to keep my mother on one end of the table, my father on the other end of the table, entertained enough that they would not enter into the tensions uh, of their own relationship. And as an only child, I was the source of entertainment, engagement. Uh, And so, when the meal came, uh, I ate I ate as rapidly as I could because I needed, in some sense, to have the next 35 minutes free from food to be able to do the work I needed to do to keep my family safe. So, as you think about what happens at the table uh, and what happens in the process of our rapid eating world, fast food, uh, is that part of the phenomena uh, of 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 the war that we're engaging. Yeah, Dan, I um you know, I can feel some tears in my eyes as I kind of uh create that dinner table scene um for you and uh all that was expected of you and how food had to get out of the way in order for you to play a role that in essence was tied to your survival. Um and how I'm imagining could correct me if I'm wrong, but it must've been absolutely impossible to um, taste and be present to feel your body's response to the nourishment. Oh, Oh gosh. I mean, it, I, I honestly, I, I would say it was n- no more than a year or two ago. Becky said to me at a dinner table, y- y- will you just slow down and like, taste your food and it was i i I get the concept but i I literally had to kind of go i don't even know what you're talking about Uh, i yes i can taste it it tastes good but i am not lingering i'm not allowing the erotic sensuality of the food the flavor uh, the different spices to actually play in my mouth. And uh, I, it did, uh, that particular moment, it just caught me with incredible grief. Like, I don't think I've eaten well, but a few times in my life, at least the way I hear the two of you talking about that process of, of, of actually taking in food as worship. I would go so far as to say that 
uh, imagining you slowing down to that level, given how much of a, of a small adult you had to be at the table with your parents, um, to slow down and really enjoy food in many ways is becoming a little boy again. Oh, and yeah. how scary oh, yeah. is that uh, at the dinner table, um, given your experience to become small um, and full of wonder? Okay. Okay. Enough. I don't want to talk anymore. Uh, and, and yet I do. I do. I, you know, it, it, as soon as we step into this, I'm having memories of the table. Uh, the food that my mother prepared was really horrendous. She was, I think, almost purposely a bad cook. Uh, and yet my father was a baker. And so uh, he would bring home uh, at the end of a day, this lavish, glorious, I mean, sometimes cakes, pies, uh, the glory of what a bakery can bring. And uh, the tension between my mother and father played out by me not wanting my mother's food, but thrilling in my father's gifts of what he brought home. You can see the tension that existed. And again, maybe I'm defending myself, uh, but to say, I don't know many homes that have a sense of joy and goodness and honor with regard to food. But that war, uh, it, 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 stepping into it, even as we're having a discussion, I can feel my body tense, uh, and yet there's also that grief that wants to begin to participate in what would it be like to engage food and no joy? Yeah, it, it, it's you know something I've learned sitting in many of your conferences, Dan, is that we do try to rush from from grief. And so um, I can I can hear that kind of nesting itself in your body, and also wanting to fight for and hope for a redemptive experience. Um, and maybe the three of us need to commemorate that um, with a three hour long meal when we can all see each other again. That would be glorious. No, they, yeah. I mean, let's, let's presume that's uh, probably not in the next, uh, well, month or two, but nonetheless, <laughs> that, it, what, what you're describing. And again, I want to come back to this, uh, particularly when we come into, you know, the redemption, uh, of, of our own war with food, but just knowing that the Bible begins with the category of worship and food, and it ends with the category of worship and food. Food is so central to our relationship with God and our relationship with others, that it is no wonder that beyond, you know, the war with shame and contempt that we've talked about at least a few times, that evil would be at work wishing to darken our capacity to take in something so good and also to offer it to others with the same pleasure that we know. So, we're, we're at a good point to begin to say, give a, give a few categories that we'll pick up next time. But what are the things that immediately come to mind from this conversation that you all would say, uh, Dan, this is what we want for you, and this is what we want for our listeners? Mm, I, I, would, I would say, um, first and foremost, let the, let the fork not be a, not be a weapon um, to be able to... Um, approach the table in a sense of um, more reverence. I, I think it's, it's astounding that we, we go so far as to bless our food when we sit down at the table and immediately become at enmity with it once the prayer is over. That's brilliant. Um, That's awful, but it's so true. It is, yes. isn't it? I mean, what if we only took the blessing at the table seriously, only that, and saw it through the rest of the meal as this, this food is a gift? That would be a profound change in the way that we engage. Absolutely. And these are, these are acts of resistance um, that are holy. I think when we take a stand against 
body oppression. We take a stand against um, diet culture, which is one of the greatest political sedatives. Um, and I believe that was Naomi Wolf who said that, but I could be wrong. Um, that we are uh, reclaiming what we were made for, that we're returning to how we came into this world as intuitive eaters um, connected to our bodies, enamored with our bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so much so we wanted to put our toes in our mouth. You know, it, <laughs> we were just in, in love and very embodied. Um, so it, it becomes a returning back to how we came into the world. And really to a a pre-traumatized state. Yes. I would say, um, Vander Kolk, uh, says that self-regulation, um, depends on having a friendly relationship with your body. Trauma severs that. And so that's why his focus so much is on uh, different kinds of therapies for trauma that help us to get reengaged with our bodies. Well, uh, let's just say even this ending uh, just gives me a sense of, oh my goodness, we wouldn't be talking about this if we didn't have hope for ourselves and for others. We may still be in struggling uh, mode at times, uh, but uh, uh, something about the redemptive process gives us a possibility to re-engage our history of eating, uh, the stories uh, of our own experience of body shaming. And I love that notion that we're able to say, hell no, no I'm not going to participate uh, in an economic, uh, and in many ways, a, a kingdom of darkness process that actually leads me to more debris, uh, furthering more debris for others, there's a way to engage this. So, that's what I want to address in our next conversation. What's the most important thing you want people to hear, even if we spend another 25 minutes talking about it? What do you most want people to hear? Uh, And then we'll step back into it. Yeah, I I would say for me, the, the, the thing that I most want people to know is that wherever they are, Uh, It doesn't matter how deeply they are into disordered eating or uh, shame or whatever it is. Uh, At any single point, it's possible to turn back toward kindness. At any point. Um, It's it's not too late. It's it's always possible to head toward kindness from where a person is. And that's, I think, linked with uh, what Diane's saying around, uh, around shame. Yeah. And just the, the neuroplasticity of the brain to be able to, to think and be differently with food in our bodies is hopeful as well. Well, given the season that we're in as one of really cultural, huge global trauma uh, and levels of stress, I mean, my dream life over the last several weeks uh, has been, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just say for myself, distressing. Uh, and, and I'm finding that I, I am moving toward the pantry far more often uh, and, and frankly, toward food that uh, high carbohydrates, uh, much more sugar, uh, salty food. Uh, but I, how do you how do you engage uh, eating that does feel like emotional eating that at least from one standpoint doesn't feel uh, honoring or good? I, I, I know this 